Chapter 5. How Renard was summoned three times. First of all, by Bruin the Bear. Bruin set out, his heart still seething with all that had happened at Breviand. The solitude of the gorges that he had to pass through, the approach of night which was already falling, with mo flashes of lightning flickering slowly on the horizon, soon partially restored his calm. His hatred of Renard remained no less strong. His hermit-like way of life and his gruff temper had developed in him a jealous vanity, and everything upset him. He was as little concerned as King Noble about Eastgroom's jealousy and honour, Tibbet's secret grievances and their tales, but ever since Lanfert's blow with the axe, he had nourished a long-standing hatred of the fox, which had been secretly simmering in his heart. After emerging from the gorges, he went forward in the cool shade of a familiar forest which was no longer threatened by any storm. He went silently, gliding along with slippered steps, as bears go on their nocturnal ways. Little owls rose beneath his feet and came down again rather farther away. He was not upset by such small things, nor even by the fetid scents of hounds heated by the chase, which still clung to the grass in spite of the damp evening dew. He reached the glade of hornbeams long before dawn. As he approached, two or three shadows retreated, growling, and disappeared among the trees. He thought he could distinguish a white tooth lying obliquely across one of the dark faces, and in this way he knew that Renard was safe, sheltered in his earth, deep down at Malpass. Bruin lay down at the foot of a moss-covered trunk and slept until the birds began to sing. He slept well, like a bear who thinks he is going to have his revenge. A lesser whitethroat and a blackbird vied with each other in musicianly ardour. The whitethroat was concealed high up beneath the leaves and could not be seen, but the blackbird, who was perching on a bramble, with his feathers puffed out and his throat full of trills, raised his orange-yellow beak towards the very place among the leaves from where fell the limpid notes of song. How peaceful it was, and how pleasant it would have been to live beneath the long-spreading branches in the light that filtered through from the young virgin day. But this was impossible, unless one's heart was free from murderous desires, as pure as the white throat song, or the water in the spring where Daisy, her hips swinging beneath her skirts, was going to fill her stone jug. Bruin saw her, but remained as still as a stone. He was not afraid that Daisy would cry out and cause Lanfert to appear at once, but he still felt such a burning desire to accomplish his mission as soon as possible. He was so obsessed with his own wishes that any intervention of mankind, causing either a dangerous obstacle or merely a delay, would have appeared equally fatal to him. Daisy, kneeling on one knee, leant down over the water, filled her jug, and with one hand brushed away a curl hanging down over her eyes. Then she rose with supple grace. She went on her way without seeing Bruin the bear. The arm that she held away from her body, glowing in the sun, the soles of her little sabots clicking against her bare heels. Renard! In the end, Bruin called out to him. Once more, the big creature did not know what lay in store for him. Everyone goes on his way in the belief that he controls his own destiny, but it is a long time since the old storyteller, who apparently had even wilder notions than his listeners, said of the young Renard that the struggle was hard and long for him, who wished to preserve his liberty in times like these. The moment was coming when each one was to complete his schooling and match his true courage against the rigours of a decision that was final. Renard! Renard! At the dark entrance to the earth, beneath the brambles, two wild eyes began to gleam. Hey! said the fox gaily. Is that Bruin the bear? My friend the bear? I am not your friend, said Bruin. So much the worse for you, replied Renard. What do you want of me? I want to summon you on behalf of the king. Why did you come so far? Why such a powerful messenger with such a solemn summons? I am a subject of the king like you, and I am your servant, friend Bruin. Will you follow me at once to Breviand? At once! Bruin the bear could not believe his ears. He was almost disappointed to find Renard so docile. He accordingly became more distrustful. 
affecting therefore scruples which he hardly felt within himself, he said, I am no friend of yours. I have told you so, and I will not even pretend to be one. But it is a far cry from that to being fond of Eastgrim. By heaven, Renard, I hoped you would escape from Surly and his tribe of dogs. Thank you, said Renard gently. And in the meantime, uttering little sounds with his jaws, clicking his tongue smoothly and making little murmurs with his lips, he let Bruin think that he was eating something at his leisure. In reality, his heart was full of hate. From the depths of the shadow he was contemplating the colossus and his long slit of a mouth where he could see a blue tongue flickering in and out. Bruin was beginning to slaver. That was a good sign. Just a moment, said Renard. Surly? He is as stupid as a wolf. But it was a pity, friend Bruin, that Grimbart, my relative, was the only one to denounce this shameful ambush. Let us say no more about it. Just a moment, I tell you. Just time for me to take some proper sustenance. Just this little hare's leg. My three sons hunt, now they have grown up. I'm only a minor lord, you know. A fox. Heaven helps those who help themselves. That's the motto of humble people like myself. At La Fouille, when a guest of noble birth arrives, tall, fat, and as broad as you across the shoulders and the flanks, what meats there are on his plate, what venison, what beef prepared with yellow pepper, what chicken minced with cream, what wine is poured generously into his goblet. But as for small men, with narrow shoulders and thin hindquarters like me, they must sit at the far end of the table, far from the hearth, the scraps of food and the dregs of wine. That is why I make my provisions in advance. I've finished, friend, and I'll follow you. Just give me time to lick these honeycombs. French honey, woodland honey, Lantfurt's honey, the honey of honey. Now he came out of his earth, licking his chops with a greedy look in his eye. L -l Lantfurt's honey, stammered Bruin. I've just seen Daisy. Has he got hives round this way? Better than that, said Renard. A woodland reserve, well hidden, but not too well for me to find it. Show me, said Bruin. No, said Renard. Why not? Because you are not my friend. Then Bruin, forgetting his distrust, his tongue hanging out, his mouth watering even more, groaned, I am your friend. Come, said Renard. He was exultant. The honey that he was savouring would not make his whiskers sticky, but it was a thousand times sweeter than the honey from Lanfert's hives. He ran briskly along beneath the hornbeams and skirted the clearing where the great forester had built his hut for the summer time. Bruin followed him, dragging his broad feet and nodding his head as though he were dancing. Quietly, friend. Go to Leeward. Here it is. Where? In the trunk of this felled tree. It was an enormous oak tree trunk, lying in the soft grass, and Lanfert intended to make a table or a kneading trough out of it. Two heavy, gleaming iron wedges had been pushed down into it to keep the cleft in the trunk apart. Bruin had already pushed his tongue and his muzzle down between them, deeper than the wedges. Further down, right at the bottom, cried Renard. And as the big head went down and disappeared up to the ears, he pushed the wedges out and delivered his enemy to the oak tree. Lanfet! Lanfet! he called. This time it's not me, it's the bear! Bruin cried out in a shrill voice, which was stifled by the thickness of the tree. Lanfert! Renard called again. All the fibres of the oak tree tightened their grip unmercifully. Bruin suffered atrocious pain, but he heard Renard's call. He knew that Lanfert would come, his terrible axe in his hand. Then, desperately, he pressed down with his strong legs on the thick rough trunk and stiffened his neck, feeling the skin crackling open beneath his fur. Then he drew back and freed his head and ears, which were streaming with blood and smarting cruelly in the keen air. 
Then he rushed away as Lanfert ran up, shouting. He sniffed up the blood that was blinding him and shook it off into the forest path. There was not enough skin left on his head to make a little purse. Never did a more hideous, gigantic and blood-stained beast present himself to the eyes of other creatures. The jays screamed, the magpies laughed, and Lanfert shouted at the top of his voice in the direction of the village that the bear was coming. Breathlessly, Bruin staggered along, bumping into the trees. He heard a troop of peasants come running along with loud shouts, their scythes rattling, their whips cracking. He turned round and bumped straight into Pastor Everard, who was just raking out his dung heap. He threw his fork right among his legs, and Bruin turned round again, heard Lanfert's axe whistle, bared his teeth, wheeled round and found himself under the hornbeams again, at the very edge of Malpass. Renard had heard all that happened, and he was waiting for him at the threshold of his earth. Ermelin, on her side, saw him go by and was left stunned. She admired Renard's boldness, but it frightened her. Hello, Bruin, laughed Renard the fox. What do you think of this red honey you've smeared all over yourself, my friend? Don't forget to give my good wishes to your loyal partners, Sir Eastgrim and dear Tibbet. Won't he be coming, the short-tailed one? Tell him I'll be delighted to see him. Hey there, Bruin. Goodbye, my friend. But the bear had finally disappeared into the depths of the undergrowth. When he reached Breviand, evening was falling. The atmosphere was more stifling than on the day before. The same storm was rumbling round below the horizon. A horrified murmur arose at the sight of the red apparition. Lord Noble gazed with curiosity at this crimson bonnet, which was full of dark, lumpy clots of blood. "'Good heavens, Bruin! You are a sight! Who got you into that state?' "'Need you ask your majesty?' groaned Bruin. "'It was he, the fox, the dreadful dwarf. It was Renard.' And he collapsed, like a dead body, at the lion's feet.'